This audiobook was created using text-to-speech software, and was not read by a real person. Please keep in mind the limitations of the technology when it comes to pacing and pronunciation. Also, if you enjoy the audiobooks we create, please consider supporting the expense of our projects through our Patreon page. Those who do so have access to exclusive book series, are able to download the MP3 files for all books we create, and also have early access to our normal YouTube releases. For more details please visit patreon.com slash yjk audiobooks. The link is also available in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the story. The Hardy Boys Book 11 While the Clock Ticked by Franklin W. Dixon Preview A banker who has been receiving threatening notes enlists the help of the Hardy Boys. Before long, the young sleuths find themselves entangled in the investigation of a notorious band of thieves. Chapter 1 A Mysterious Tip I wonder who that man is, Frank, whispered blonde Joe Hardy, peering curiously from a second floor window of their home. He looks worried. His brother glanced down at the stranger just departing from the front door. Let's ask Aunt Gertrude. She talked with him. Joe, a year younger and more impetuous than his 18-year-old, dark-haired brother, bounded downstairs. Frank followed. Aunt Gertrude, Joe cried excitedly, who was the man who just left? Fenton Hardy's sister shrugged. I don't know, said the tall, black-haired woman. He wanted your father to solve a mystery. I told him Fenton was away. The boys waited to hear no more. As they dashed out the door, Frank said, Why, Auntie, we're detectives too, remember? Joe was first to reach the stranger, who was about to drive off in a convertible. Sir, he said earnestly, please wait. As Frank caught up with his brother, the tall, vigorous-looking man stared at them through rimless glasses. The boys saw a wary look come over his face. Well, what is it? he demanded impatiently. Quickly Frank explained. We're Frank and Joe Hardy. Our aunt told us you wanted Dad to solve a mystery. Since he isn't at home, we thought maybe we could help you. Mr. Hardy's sons, the man burst out. Listen. I'm in real trouble, and I must see your father. I'll pay any amount to contact him. Just tell me where he can be reached. Joe shook his head. No use, Mr. Dalrymple. Raymond Dalrymple of Lakeside. I'm in the banking business. Look here, why can't I get in touch with Fenton Hardy? Dad and mother have gone on a camping trip up in Maine. They can't be reached by telephone or telegraph. A look of desperation came into the banker's eyes. I can't entrust this business to boys, he muttered, as if thinking aloud. It's not as if we were beginners at sleuthing, Joe said persuasively. Frank and I have helped Dad on many cases. He gave a sudden grin. Even Aunt Gertrude would admit we've had some success, too. Mr. Dalrymple smiled faintly, then gave the boys a swift, penetrating look. Like to follow in your world-famous dad's footsteps, eh, be detectives yourselves, would you? His keen eyes took in the hiking boots and khaki outfits they wore. Fine summer morning for a hike. He added abruptly, which direction are you taking? Before either boy could answer he went on. Try Shore Road, past the harbor. Turn off and follow Willow River Road out into the country. Why? Frank queried, intrigued. You'll pass the old Purdy place. Know the one I mean. Big stone house, Joe answered. Slate roof. Stands back from the road away. Nobody's been living there for some time, though. You're observant, the banker commented. For a moment he was silent, as if trying to make a decision. He pulled nervously at his hat brim. 
Okay, boys, he said finally. You want to be detectives. Take a look around there on your hike. The brothers waited expectantly for further explanation. But instead of giving any, the banker started his car and drove off. Boy, oh boy. Joe exploded. We have a mystery, and we don't know what it's about. Frank, too, was baffled. Well, let's get back to the house. The fellows will be here soon. The Hardys found Aunt Gertrude waiting for them in the living room. Well, I suppose you're head over heels in another case. I can tell by your faces. What did that man want? Frank and Joe gave her a quick report. We didn't find out why he wanted to see Dad, Frank admitted. But one thing's certain. We'll hike right to the pretty place. Miss Hardy cast her eyes upward. Well, if you're bound to get yourselves involved in another risky case, I should know there's no stopping you until you solve it. The boys exchanged knowing winks. Beneath her peppery manner, their aunt was actually very proud of her nephew's sleuthing abilities. Suddenly there came a loud banging from the back of the house and a clomp, clomp of heavy footsteps through the kitchen. The next moment a chunky, jolly-looking boy marched into the living room. He had a knapsack on his back, and wore big high-top boots. Ready, he sang out. Tramp, tramp, the boys are marching. I got the provisions, so don't worry. My only worry is, Chet, that you'll eat them before the rest of us have a chance. Joe laughed. Chet Morton was one of the Hardy's best friends. Decided where you want to go, inquired Biff Hooper, another chum, who had come in behind Chet. Let's try Willow River Road, Joe suggested offhandedly. Suits me, lanky Biff agreed readily. With a hasty farewell to Aunt Gertrude, the four pals set out. Brisk walking brought them swiftly out of town on the shore road, which followed horseshoe-shaped Barmet Bay. Looking back, they could see the docks of the harbor. Some distance ahead of them was the bridge which spanned the mouth of Willow River where it emptied into the bay. The boys turned right down the river road, which had deep ditches on both sides. They rounded the sharp corner Indian file, Frank leading, then crossed to the left-hand side of the road so they would be facing any oncoming traffic. Suddenly there was a screeching of tires behind them. The hikers whirled to see the gleaming chromium grille of a black limousine. The big car had swerved wide around the turn, hugging the left shoulder of the road. Jump, shouted Frank. He shoved Chet Morton into the ditch and landed on top of him. Joe and Biff dived to the side also. Even in the instant of leaping to safety, Joe had taken a penetrating glance at the driver of the car. Now, as the boys picked themselves up, he was able to report. Mean-looking customer, husky, with a big jaw. Close crew cut. Well, he nearly flattened us, complained Biff. What's a tough guy like that doing in a limousine? Running down innocent hikers, Chet answered indignantly. They climbed back to the road, and started out once more. Presently they came to a section of large houses, set back on extensive grounds. Some of the estates were well kept, but a few had fallen into disrepair. Those on the left, the boys knew, were bounded in the rear by Willow River. Half an hour later, as they rounded a sharp bend, a long, high stone wall came into view. A tangle of ivy clung to the stones, and close-growing young trees partially screened the wall from the road. Here and there, however, the boys caught a glimpse of a bluish slate roof. The pretty house, said Joe, looking with intent curiosity. Gone to seed, since the old man died, Biff Hooper added. I hear he was a queer fellow. Something in Joe's lingering tone had warned the easygoing Chet Morton that there was an underlying significance to the remark. Wait a minute, fellows, he began. Something tells me we didn't come this way just by accident. If it's another mystery, you can count me out. I'm not over the last one yet. Well, to be honest, Chet, Frank said with a chuckle, we did have a visitor, just before you showed up. He suggested we look over this place. No fooling. Biff exclaimed eagerly. 
the boys had reached the main gate to the place. To their surprise, they found it open, with the marks of automobile tires in the driveway. As the four walked up the drive, which was lined with the dense green foliage of thick bushes and trees, the silence was broken by a gruff voice. Hey, you fellows. A figure in the white helmet and black boots of a motorcycle patrolman strode toward them. It's Mike DeSalvo, said Joe, recognizing the officer. What's up, Mike? The Hardy boys, through their father's detective work and their own, knew all the Bayport policemen. Harbor thieves, said the officer briefly. I was driving up Willow River Road when I spotted them roaring toward me. Then they hit that sharp bend, and I lost sight of them. I was sure they ducked in here, but I can't find the car. It was a big, black limousine. End of chapter 1 Editor's Note Due to restrictions beyond our control, we are unable to release this entire book on our YouTube channel. However, you can listen to this entire book, completely free of charge, on our Patreon page using the link in the video description below. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the story.